We're going to take you live here at a city hall where Deputy Mayor Jennifer McKelvey is speaking to reporters ahead of today's council meeting. Let's listen increased in. homelessness costs during the pandemic. As you know, the 2023 city budget finalized last month also includes a $933 million shortfall due to ongoing COVID-19 costs, again, largely transit and shelter costs. I'm disappointed the Deputy Prime Minister, a Toronto MP, would ignore a direct commitment the federal Liberals made during the last election to the City of Toronto. I'm thankful for the many productive conversations I've had with many Toronto area MPs who understand the importance of making investments in transit and housing for our most vulnerable. As a city, we made the decision to fund transit and fund unprecedented homelessness supports throughout the pandemic so that we protected the TTC and we protected our most vulnerable residents. It was the right thing to do. We have raised property taxes every year, including this year, with the largest property tax increase since amalgamation. And we have introduced new revenue tools available to us, including the city building levy and the vacant home tax to help fund our budgets. The city has also found $2.5 billion in offsets, savings and efficiencies during the pandemic, including $786 million this year. We have been very clear to the Government of Canada what the city's needs are and about the importance of supporting Toronto, the country's economic engine. My job right now is to stand up for Toronto and I won't hesitate to fight to make sure our city and its residents receive our fair share from other governments. Our advocacy will continue in the weeks and months ahead. Last December, City Council voted to request the Government of Canada honour its federal election campaign commitment and help address the 2022 budget shortfall. In the event that the Government of Canada failed to honour its election commitment, Council directed the Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer to include the impact of the lack of funding in the 2023 property tax notices. While I hope that we can still find a way for our two governments to work together in this interim period to address Toronto's immediate budget issues, this message will be delivered in every 2023 final property tax notice. Our ongoing financial challenges demonstrate that we need a new fiscal framework for Toronto. I remain committed to having those discussions with the provincial and federal governments. At this council meeting, the first item of business is a report from city staff on the long-term financial update and outlook. I think this report provides an important look at the city's long-term financial pressure and the picture beyond our immediate issues. It shows the progress we have made addressing the capital backlog with initiatives like the City Building Fund, but it also shows that raising property taxes or slashing services won't solve this long-term issue. The report clearly shows that Toronto needs a new fiscal framework. As noted in the report, the city faces operating and capital pressures of $46.5 billion over the next 10 years with the major drivers being our state of good repair and transit costs. This is a revenue structural issue, which is the result of a mismatch between the responsibilities placed on Toronto by other orders of government and our lack of legal and revenue raising powers that are available to the province and the federal government. The report is also clear that the city cannot use its reserves or deferred revenues as a balancing strategy to offset its short or long-term financial pressures. The next steps in the report are clear. The city is conducting a full assessment of all revenue tools within its jurisdiction. And as I said, we know this issue cannot be resolved through increased property taxes or reducing service levels alone. The magnitude is simply too large. The second key item at Council today is a report from city staff on SmartTrack. The city government, with the cooperation of our federal and provincial partners, is finally moving forward with getting transit built. We are at a key moment where we can make sure we keep moving transit forward that will benefit generations to come. 
As the city staff report notes, the Smart Track, the Smart Track Stations program represents a significant investment to improve transportation choices within Toronto and leverages existing transit infrastructure to serve more people. Combined with Metrolinx's GO expansion program, SmartTrack will accelerate the transformation of heavy rail infrastructure in Toronto from a regional commuter service into an urban rapid transit network, bringing transit faster to communities across the city. Shovels could be in the ground this year for some stations, and some stations could be open to riders in three years. The staff report is clear that this project like everything else right now, is grappling with increased costs. I believe in spending money to get transit built, not spending millions and then letting transit projects fall by the wayside due to politics. I'm so proud of our city's progress on transit. I look forward to seeing this project move forward and seeing transit built in the city of Toronto. I'm now happy to take your questions on these items or any other matters. Back to the budget, there have been warnings throughout this process that if the federal government or the Ontario government wasn't able to come through on promises, there's potential for cuts. Where are we potentially going to see that? So you're going to see those cuts rapidly happen in 2024 if we don't get assistance. Uh, we are able to use the reserves we've squirreled away uh, to pay for this year. Um, but it's not a good strategy going forward. It's like taking out your RRSPs to pay your mortgage or to pay your groceries. It's not sustainable. We need a new fiscal framework. We need the province and the federal government to start having those conversations with us right now. Mayor, you, you mentioned the federal government in there as well, uh, a lot. I didn't hear much of the blunt words that you shared to them, to the provincial government. They also didn't come through with the money that you were hoping for. What, why not? Take it to them as well. So the provincial government came through with the 2022 operating funds that we asked for. The province uh, did step up around that and they have committed to an ongoing conversation about 2023. The federal government has not stepped up with the 2022 operating costs. That's urgent. Property tax notices are being prepared at the end of this week. They did not give us a commitment to 2022 and they have not committed to ongoing conversations about 2023 either. Within the provincial budget, there was also good news for Toronto in there. There was $48 million for supportive housing. There was $500 million across the province. We're looking to see what the city's share is in mental health. Uh, there was funding for guns and gangs. There was funding for fair integration of our system uh, throughout the GTA. And there was funding for the Runnymede Mental Health Centre. These are tangible investments in Toronto. We're not seeing that in the federal government and they're not uh, stepping up with the conversation with us about how we move forward together. Deputy Mayor, since John Tory's time and now your time, there's been a lot of fist waving in Parliament Hill and absolutely nothing has happened. Most people don't read the fine print on the property tax bill. I know John Tory had talked about potentially going out and canvassing in MPs' wards, like your writings rather, like he did to fight the public health cuts under the province. Uh, he even mentioned maybe in uh, uh, Minister Freeland's ward, he would be knocking on the door saying, your government is failing you. I know you're only here for a little while, but is there anything more or you're just yelling and tax notices? It's going in the tax notices and that's going to be a big awakening for Toronto residents to see that in their tax bill when it arrives. Um, we're continuing that advocacy. Uh, many of the Toronto MPs are engaging in those conversations with us. I'm hopeful that they can continue to put pressure on their leaders of their government to step up for Toronto. I'm a collaborator by nature. This is what I do. This is why I was a scientist and even as a politician, I have that same approach of collaboration. And I'm really, really hopeful that we can get this conversation going with the federal government so that we can help the people of Toronto. So the Trudeau government salvaged another minority only with GTA and especially Toronto, all, all liberal wins. So what are you saying to Trudeau? Are you saying that you're gonna like campaign against them in the next election or Toronto, what do you say? I'm saying Toronto deserves better. Uh, we need to have an important conversation about how to help this, the country's largest economic engine. Uh, we need to work together so that we can solve these really crucial problems around homelessness and around operating of the TTC. Uh, Toronto needs to be successful so our country is successful. Are at stake as far as which ones would be deferred if the money doesn't come in, of course, to defer 
So that will be decided through the 2024 budget process, and that is the important conversations that we're going to have to Toronto residents. Uh, what are the services that uh, you want to see protected? But we also need to have a very real conversation about what things the City of Toronto provides that is better provided or funded by other levels of government. So the other levels of government either need to come through with additional revenue tools so that we can fund these things, or they need to help us with, with those costs directly for those items. We are operating social supports out of a property tax base. This is at a scale that other municipalities simply aren't. Uh, we're also operating the largest transit system in our country and it is it is uh, being used by people across the whole region not just Toronto residents so I think there's a strong case to be made for operating support uh, for the TTC by the provincial and the federal governments I think there's also a whole lot of social services very very needed that they can also step up with So that is something that we'll be asking city staff this morning as we discuss discuss the financial outlook. Uh, we have been very careful to start to earmark, earmark reserves so that they can cover this year's costs. I do think we had high hopes for the 2022 federal money. So we do need to confirm that with this funding not coming through for the federal government, the 2023 plan can still go forward. Well, uh, what this budget reads as, when I look at it, is uh, a budget that is very focused on growth. And I understand that. We want our country to grow. The problem is Toronto is still very much in the mode of recovery, and we need help with recovery. We still have costs from homelessness. We still have costs from decreased ridership on the TTC. And so while the federal government wants to focus on growth, they can't leave municipalities that are very much in a state of recovery behind. The other thing they need to recognize is that while their revenue tools grow with the economy and income tax revenue grows with the economy, the tools we have to raise revenue in the city of Toronto, namely property tax, does not grow with the economy to the same extent. We have a structural issue in the way we fund cities. We need to have that conversation. We need to solve that problem. And the conversation needs to start about it today, or there are going to be very, very big impacts for 2024. Some people say an obvious uh, place for cuts could be smart track. It was kind of John Tory's vanity project. Really, transit experts say it only exists in names that the city is putting on certain stations. The province could be funding it, and the province could be just getting rid of the branding. Why not get rid of this smart track pretense? We have the ability to build transit now to keep people going where they need to go. Uh, shovels could be in the ground for smart track this year. It's important that we continue with all of those important capital projects that we have on the book. What we're having problems right now is with operating, operating costs. We've asked for that help with that operating. If we're not getting it, then we need to have a very, very real conversation about how we fund operating in the city of Toronto. That means new revenue tools, and that means a new fiscal framework. I, I know when it comes to some of the budget cuts that could come next year. It's, it's all abstract at the moment because these discussions need to happen. But when you're banking on residents going, going at MPs to say, listen, don't, don't do this, can you just give a general idea of some of the things that might be up for the chopping block that you'd like to see avoided uh, by getting this money? Well, usually what happens when we start to have budget pressures is we start to scale back on state of good repair. And we know that's important. We have roads to repair. We have community centers that need repair. We have arenas I hear about all the time that need repair. So it's, that tends to be, unfortunately, what goes first. Uh, then we start to have looking at uh, expansions of programs, right? And uh, I think we'll have to, right now, another one we need to look at very closely is the TTC. We are running more service right now than we have ridership. We have 70, about 70% 70 ridership right now. That is the least place that I would ever like to see a cut. But we are being almost entirely funded through the fare box. That is a problem if we don't get operating TTC money from other levels of government. How do other cities uh, manage their operating costs? Uh, how do they, what, uh, sort of, what money do they get that we don't get? 
So other cities around the GTA, I've spoken with some of the mayors, they're not in the same situation that we are because they are not operating shelters at the scale that we are, and they are not operating a transit system at the scale that we are that has a huge decrease in ridership. Uh, Toronto is unique in many respects in uh, just the size, the scale of our city, um, but there are also other municipalities around us that, uh, that have shortfalls as well, and I know that they'll be engaging in those conversations as well. Um, it's not one size fits all. I think each municipality has uh, a unique uh, financial situation. I think for the most part, though, the larger cities are the ones that tend to be struggling right now. Well, I think through the past, when there's been a failure of other levels of government to step up, the city of Toronto has. And we've filled the gaps for a very long time. And we've put that on to the property tax base, and that's how we funded it. Um, the more we just keep stepping in to solve the problems, the more we've let the provincial and the federal governments off the hook. And I think they've come to expect that we'll just, we'll just figure it out. We're now at a point where with the decreased ridership, with the level of shelter system that we're operating, we need help from those other levels of government and it's time for them to step up. Many advocates would say looking at the TTC as a revenue stream is the problem. It's why ridership is down, decreasing service is only gonna also increasing the fare isn't helping either. Is there some world where you admit that maybe your whole TTC strategy needs to be looked at altogether overall? We can't continue to rely on fair revenue to fund the TTC. We need to have a long-term commitment from the other levels of government to operate transit. That happens in most major North American cities. Most other major North American cities also have a revenue tool that grows with the economy, like a portion of an income tax or like a sales tax. We don't have that available to us in the city of Toronto. So we fund transit from the fare box and from our property tax base, and it's not sustainable. We do need a new deal. And is it that simple? Like, if we have this new revenue stream that you're talking about that's tied to the rate of inflation, all these things, that everything will be well, if we have a new revenue stream that will help us to ensure that we continue to operate our TTC at full capacity, it will also help us with the state of good repair that needs to be done on the TTC. When I started in 2019 and I uh, was on the TTC board at our first meeting, we released a report about the cost of state of good repair for the TTC. And in 2019, uh, it was identified that just to keep our existing transit system going, that's the subways, the buses, that we already had would be $33 billion over 10 years. And we came up with a plan and we were making great strides on that. The new situation that we're in resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic with decreased ridership, with increased costs that we're seeing, um, not just through operating of our shelters, but also through inflation, that has really um, made the state of good repair work take a step back. And I'm very sad by that and disappointed. We need to get back there. We need to get back on track with our state of good repair on the TTC. That will continue to want riders to come uh, when they have a, a very reli reliable, dependable system. And so we do need to advocate to those other levels of government. And just last question for you, Kira. You say that you know cuts to services aren't the answer uh, and you want to avoid them as much as possible. But clearly, service cuts are being made. You mentioned the TTC uh, you know, reducing are things that can be up on the chopping block. How do we get to a place where those things are reinstated back to their full capacity? So um, what we've been told right now with the TTC is that they are continuing to prioritize deployment of service um, to ensure that where we need ridership, where we have ridership the most that we continue to serve, so we're not having crowding, making sure that we're servicing our priority neighborhoods, um, and there is a full commitment to continue to grow as ridership comes back. There has been some, uh, some minor uh, decreases in service. We want to get it back as soon as possible. We need people to ride. We need people to come back. But more importantly than that, we what I'm saying here today is we need help from the provincial and the federal governments to help us with long-term operating costs of the TTC and uh, and to help the city as well. Do you think Ottawa and Queen's Park are going to actually sort of pay, pay much attention until uh, 
until we, uh, until after the, the mayoral by-election? <laughs> So the the books are closing for 2022, uh, so that is very much the problem I have at hand. Uh, that is my biggest concern right now. So it's that 235 from last year. Um, the conversation about 2023 is continuing. The provincial government has been very good in engaging with us um, on those discussions, and I'm hopeful that we can start those conversations with uh, the federal government. And I look forward to the new mayor on June 26th continuing that and getting a good deal for Toronto. So I think you're highlighting an important problem that we have, and that's where we're going back year over year for the same things. So a good example of that is our refugee shelters. Uh, we only recently uh, found out that the federal government would reimburse us for our refugee shelter costs for 2022. We have not heard that commitment for 2023. So every single year we have to go back. We want to accept people in Toronto. We want this to be their home. We need the federal government to step up with a long-term commitment around that. There's uh, many other things. Supportive housing is another good example where year after year we go to the provincial government and we ask for funding. They've come through with the 2023 funding, um, but you're exactly right that longer-term deals around these things are very much needed. And it's helpful, it's helpful for us on the books, it gives us stability, it gives us the ability to uh, expand in a sustainable way. So there is a lot of merit in looking into that too. Deputy Mayor, it, the, um, one of the other key items on the agenda today is declaring the mayor of seat vacant. Um, is it just, I'm wondering if frankly it's going to happen today because council being what it is, you never know. And um, is it really just a situation that we've got to start this process rolling even though effectively the campaign is under uh, I think that it's a formality. I think that you will see uh, council vote to declare the seat vacant today and launch the by-election. I think that council, uh, as much as uh, they might may, may like or dislike me, I think they're eager to meet their new mayor. So I think we'll get that uh, through council today. We have answered this question. The office of the mayor is, is independent. It will continue to be independent. Uh, I am a voter. I will be voting on June 26th, so I'll be watching closely also. Uh, I think that all of council should look at that, see what their heart says, vote accordingly. But I also know that that motions were passed around this last December. Uh, that was sent to Queen's Park and they haven't made any changes. So we can vote on how we feel about strong mayor powers, but ultimately it's up to the Ford government to decide uh, what their stance is on strong mayor powers and if those should continue. Do you think that something changes this campaign where we actually know that the mayor is going to have strong, stronger mayor powers? Because obviously we learned about a lot of them after the election. I think that given we have strong mayor powers, the residents of Toronto should be watching very closely, paying even more attention than they have in the past. But I have every confidence in the people of Toronto to elect the right person on June 26th. Okay, thank you.